Let's see here. Uh, next, we have another presentation from ORNL. Uh, we don't know the conclusions of this, so uh, stay glued. The title is An Efficient Distributed Burst Buffer System for Luster. Our speaker is Bradley Settlemeyer. Uh, he's a programmer tools developer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory's Computer Science and Mathematics Division, primarily interested in exploiting the performance of parallel file systems for non-scientific workloads. Woo! He's also interested in accelerating data workloads that involve pairing high-performance networks with high-performance storage hardware. Bradley Settlemeyer, thank you. So that should say an efficient distributed burst buffer for Lustre, not for Linux. Sorry about that. Um, so this is, uh, a lot of this is the work of Ting Wang, a student at Auburn University. His advisor is Wei Kuan Yu. And then three of us from ORNL have helped out some, uh, Sarpa Rao, me, Brad Settlemeyer, and Scott Atchley. So um, the largest factor driving the design of current leadership class facility file systems is checkpointing performance, which is this workload that you expect to occur once an hour for five minutes where you stream 50% of memory down into storage. And it's kind of unfortunate that this is what's driving the entire design and genesis of these file systems uh, for such a specialized workload that can and in many ways isn't the kind of things that I would like to see file systems do. And so the first thing you always think of is uh, why can't scientific applications just overlap their computation and I.O.? And I guess I have a more skeptical view of that than Eric does. Um, I don't think they can. Um, the problem is they're time step based and the application's current state drives its next state and so there's no way to issue the buffers into the storage calls and leave them there unmodified. You need to modify them and continue time stepping along as you go along the, time, as you go along the simulation. And so um, you're already under significant memory pressure so you can't just copy the memory off or anything. Um, as you coordinate, the problems get even worse. And so. Uh, the realities of checkpointing is it's work no one even really wants to do. We only do it because the systems fail. And uh, so there's, I guess, two kind of key observations that, you know, whenever you get a 10 million uh, hour allocation, inside allocation on Titan, you already have to go ahead and throw away 10% of that or a million hours to do checkpointing. And you're upset about that to begin with if you're an application developer. And you sure as heck don't want it to be 2 million or 3 million. Um, but it's also true that whenever the system fails, any work that you did after the last checkpoint is also wasted time. So you want to minimize that wasted time. So if you look at something like Titan, it has a mean time to interrupt of roughly one day. Um, that does not imply one checkpoint per day. Uh, the current rule of thumb, if you look on the website for NCCS, is four hours. Um, and the next system, the Coral system, which is where we're going to be projecting this burst buffer to, has a desired MTTI of roughly the same thing, uh, 12 to 24 hours, and it explicitly states that it wants 90% job efficiency, that it wants to be able to check checkpoint six minutes every hour, so throwing away six minutes of work an hour. And it may well checkpoint once an hour. Um, during times whenever the system is unreliable, that may be something that's necessary, and maybe whenever times that it's more reliable, we won't have to throw it away quite the full 10% of work. So what I did was I took the two previous systems, um, Widow and Jaguar and Atlas and Titan. And so the first two rows describe the actual compute system. Uh, both of these have 18,000 clients. Um, they were, uh, Titan is an upgrade of, by adding GPUs and RAM. Um, so for the Jaguar system, you have 300 terabytes of RAM. And these are all real rough estimates. I didn't want to, wasn't going to be too picky in how I did the projections. You'll see that it may not matter very much uh, as we go along. So. Um, the two, key, the two key takeaways here, so we've got 192 servers um, for Widow or Spider, um, and we've got a total system capacity of 10 petabytes, 240 gigabytes per second. Moving forward to Atlas, we increased the number of IO servers by 50%. Um, we also increased the storage capacity per server by 50%. We got a tripling in the system capacity. However, we got a quadrupling in the actual system bandwidth. So that's good news, right? That's your, your efficiency in that, along that regard, along that axis is improving. So I took that and I tried to calculate some ratios to see if I could project into the future. And the two that seem to be, that I'm going to use to do the projections, and you can disagree with these, um, are the IO server bandwidth to capacity. Uh, that seems to be holding constant. Now shingling and hammer and uh, alternative medias may drive those differently. And then also looking at the storage system overhead, which was roughly system 60% uh, 
for uh, aggregating the servers into a distributed storage system for Widow, and it's the last row, and 21% whenever we aggregate the Atlas file system. So that improved as well, and that explains a lot of the speed up from uh, the 3x increase in capacity and 4x increase in performance. So um, Jaguar spider combination was 10 and a half minutes to write 50% of RAM. So to get 90% efficiency, you checkpointed once each uh, one and a half hours. That's not too bad. Um, on the other hand, there was times whenever Jaguar wasn't reliable enough to, to get an hour uh, during some unfortunate periods where there was some hardware problems. Uh, Titan and Atlas is a good bit better. Um, twice the memory, but still only five minutes to do the checkpointing. Um, but the real tricks come in the next system. So it's unclear what exactly this system is going to be. I just took the Coral proposal and kind of broke it down and looked at the relations inside of it. I'm not under the NDA, so I think I'm allowed to do that. Um, some guidelines that you can kind of find out in their published work is uh, 10,000 to 50,000 nodes, which is a really big range, so it's hard for me to make many projections there, and at least four petabytes of RAM for the system. And we've talked about how they desire a six-minute checkpoint. So if we were to build a hypothetical storage system for this, just based off of that, we would need five and a half terabytes per second to stream out two terabytes of, uh, oh, that should be petabytes, or no, 4,000, two, two petabytes of RAM. And so if we figure that the I.O. servers are going to be roughly based on EDR, then they'll probably have something like eight gigabytes per second. If we hold the, I've got green describes the uh, projections that I'm holding constant, or that I'm assuming, I guess. So if we keep the uh, bandwidth to capacity ratio roughly the same, and we keep the storage system overhead roughly the same, we can see we built a storage, sy storage system with 825 I.O. servers. And that's not too bad. That's probably buildable, but that's not great. That's a lot of, that's a lot of leaf nodes, a lot of machines to keep stable on your, on your network. Um, and the concern here might be that we're kind of at the, the Atlas is kind of at the knee of the curve, and that now we're starting to increase servers a lot to get that improved performance. And even if we increase the projection of the file system and say, hey, it's a perfect file system, no overhead, 1.0 is the overhead, you get every single bit of your aggregate bandwidth. Um, you still only get down to something like 688 servers in this case. Um, you do drop your capacity from, by the total of a single atlas. So you go from a 160 petabyte system down to a 130 petabyte system. But that's not what's actually in the Coral proposal. So the Coral proposal has a set of relations. Um, those relations describe how memory and checkpointing and time and uh, how those sizes are all related. So if we start with some assumptions, stick with the same uh, bandwidth to capacity ratios, the same storage system overhead, we get these kind of numbers. So it's actually a smaller system than uh, Atlas uh, if we hold these numbers constant. So that's only 226 I.O. servers, um, 9 gigabytes per second. Again, that's probably achievable with uh, EDR. And it's only 1.7 terabytes per second uh, for aggregate system bandwidth, which obviously will not do the checkpointing. Um, the trick is that even that number might be as much as a third high. If you read the RFP really carefully, you see that there might be a loophole where you only have to store every third checkpoint into the file system. So that could be um, a third of that in theory. But I don't, I don't know if, if I haven't, they haven't told me that that's exactly what they have planned. And so what they've uh, proposed along with that is a burst buffer. And so this is where things get challenging. Um, so if the burst buffer is roughly 100 to 200 nodes, We've, we've got several issues. Um, we have 100 to 200 nodes that have an ingress bandwidth of 5.7 terabytes per second. We have 100 to 200 nodes that have to be able to drive a file system at 1.7 or thereabouts terabytes a second. And we've got to have 100 to 200 nodes that uh, encapsulate about 13 petabytes of storage. And all those are pretty difficult to accomplish, um, in my opinion. I guess I'm a little bit more skeptical. And so what you see is there's roughly a 10x bandwidth um, per byte of capacity increase required for this thing. And so I tried to figure out, well, what could deliver 29 to 57 gigabytes per second? And so if we're using today's technology, uh, that would be two to four DDR3 modules, probably two sockets, maybe as many as three, depending on how you have things clocked. Um, that's about 31 to 60 PCIe uh, 3.0 lanes. That's almost definitely two sockets. I think an Ivy Bridge can get you 40 lanes now, maybe if you're lucky. Um, but with PCIe 4, which I guess would be the technology of the time, maybe, that's a, maybe you've got a single socket solution there whenever you're still, still having to jack into the communications network on both sides. Um, how to manage that traffic is still uh, really interesting to me. But, so then the, you have the burst buffer. It's got to have this fast ingress. Um, and so what this drives is 
it, it, it leaves a really unclear picture of the, the file system performance. Um, and my hope is that what this means is that the file system can now be provisioned separately and not driven by this checkpointing dragon that, that just drives it to, to madness, that hopefully the, now this burst buffer will just become a good client to the file system. And so if we want to switch to different media and change that, that bandwidth to capacity ratio and get something more realistic in achieving some of those numbers, it should be possible. And with shingling and hammer, those things may be required anyway. So this is kind of how, uh, this agrees with Eric's picture more or less of how you're going to simulate, of how you're going to assemble all this. The burst buffer lives at the edge of the compute system. It uses the compute infrastructure. It's got a compute network. Um, and then it attaches to the storage nodes. Maybe it replaces routers, maybe it complements routers, maybe it replaces forwarding layers, maybe it complements forwarding layers, some of that's still unclear. And so in order to figure out how to build this, we decided to, we would create a burst buffer and being interested in time to solution, we wanted to use memcache as a quick prototyping effort. Um, and mem memcache comes with kind of a burst buffer style semantic. And the only, uh, the real trick as we get to working on this, I think, is gonna be um, hardening a burst buffer to actually provide the level of reliability that's gonna be required. It's running on the unreliable side of the network, not on the reliable hardened uh, storage side. And so the cap theorem is one of the important things whenever you're trying to build a, take a, what, what may be m mildly unreliable components and build a really strong strengthened system. And the typical formulation is you can choose any two of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Um, availability and partition tolerance would pretty much have to be the two we pick and give up the consistency. And there's, a more, there's more subtle variations on it. That whenever you're not partitioned, you can provide a little bit more consistency than whenever you are partitioned. Um, so memcache creates a pool of storage servers. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it. It's a popular web caching uh, technology. It's all socket-based communication, so that won't work for us, so that's gotta go. Um, stores key value pairs in a two-level cache. Um, client chooses the server, server chooses the bucket. No guarantee consistency, um, but that's pretty easy to work around. HPC all uses middleware to write out its data, so as long as we can get some tagging in the, in the, the metadata for the uh, keys and values, we should be okay. And one problem that may be, one thing that may be more problematic is that all clients need to know about all servers. As long as the number of burst buffers stays reasonably moderate, maybe that's not too big of an issue. So the first thing we had to do was port memcache to uh, use high performance interconnects. So CCI is a technology at ORNL, Scott Ashley works a great deal with this, and so uh, it's basically a lightweight RDMA abstraction layer, um, can run on Ethernet to Gemini, to Ares, all along the way, and so it's really nice for our efforts and it, it makes this way more portable. Um, we need to add a checkpoint semantic, so we need the ability to embed data into the key that describes the actual application data being written, and we need a way to tag an entire checkpoint to being part of a single epic. Um, so that we can figure out how to stream those out into storage. Um, then we need a scheme to flush data to a file system. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple, or well, one of those in depth. And it's called Burst Mem. Um, and at present, it only writes to memory inside of the system. So uh, here's the same picture from earlier with Burst Mem there. Um, so the axes, the x-axes on this are a little bit unfortunate. Um, I apologize for that. So uh, that's a power of two x-axis. So even though you see uh, a version of IOR that we instrumented to use memcache puts, um, you see a parabolic increase that's, that's actually a linear increase. It's increasing with the network. Um, and that's what we want to see. Um, the burst buffer should in general scale with the network. So we were able to instrument puts into IOR. Maybe that's a too synthetic of a benchmark and not too interesting. So Ting also uh, ported S3D, a uh, Fortran IO code, um, into it. Um, as you can see, that's, it runs on cube roots, and the x-axis there is some kind of weird log power of three, maybe. Um, and again, you can see that it's linear growth with respect to the network. So it's completely network bound, which is what you're trying to achieve on this kind of effort here. So. Where we get to the real tricks are whenever we start about thinking about how to flush data off of this thing. Um, we've got to get the data off. You've got, you, you're in theory pushing data at all times, and, but you're gonna have it sorted into this burst buffer cache on memcache where everything has been hashed to all kinds of random locations, um, which may not be ideal. So the first thing Ting did was he implemented two-phase I.O., and that was a pretty good result. But as we heard in the earlier talk, two-phase I.O. has some, uh, whenever you deploy it, there's some engineering issues that go along with it. You have to have extra memory space. A burst buffer probably going to be under some degree of memory pressure. 
but whenever you shuffle all the data, you have to have enough space that you can do the reorganization. And so we tried to come up with a new idea. I always try to have one new idea. And uh, limited skew IO. Um, I was going to call it skew phase IO, but I thought the opportunity for jokes might be too high there. So it might still be too high. Might have to change the name. But so it's the same basic idea. The first thing we do is we exchange the metadata. You can see that they each have uh, slightly out of order um, portions of the file. Exchange the metadata so that everyone can build their own independent view of what's in the uh, other burst buffers. And then rather than doing any coordination at all, they all start writing. And the theory is that they're going to write and it's going to be slightly out of order. Um, and everybody's going to try and meter themselves to some degree to keep the skew to a minimum. Um, and it's kind of like NTP and that you're trying to keep the skew down and you're measuring the feedback of what you're getting. And the goal is that even though it's out of order, um, the issue rate should be really high. And if we're using high performance RAID controllers, uh, I've had really good luck in XDD with writing things slightly out of order and trying not to work, worry too much about ordering, paying no synchronization costs, but getting really high issue rates, achieving really high performance levels. And so I'm hopeful that that'll be the case here. Um, Hopefully this won't require too much engineering and tuning. I, if, I, if I beat it by just having a, a huge engineering effort, I'm not sure that's the goal. But hopefully this is a way of having um, loosely coordinated I.O. that can generate high levels of performance without using high levels of uh, synchronization and keep that high issue rate. And so whenever the skew drift gets too far, we exchange some more metadata. And then we start the second phase of shipping data. And so the goal is to keep the issue rates up. Um, so there's a lot of concerns, or well, I have a lot of concerns about this, and I guess one of my uh, chief concerns is what happens if there's a 10% performance loss on the burst buffer. So if we're using Flash or we're using some kind of NVRAM and it has some kind of culling process, what happens? Well, the checkpoint time goes from six minutes to six and a half minutes. That's really not a big deal. Um, there's plenty of time. On the other hand, if the flush time goes from 60 minutes to 66 minutes per hour, as Devesh was describing earlier, that's an unstable queue. And so now you have to have some kind of mitigation strategy on what you're going to do. Are you going to prevent egress? Are you going to drop a checkpoint at that point? What does that mean to your users if you're only writing every third checkpoint out as it is? How, how, do, you, how do you manage that? Um, I have no idea how to, how to resolve those issues right now. Then there's a lot of concerns with overlapping reads and writes in my mind, too. Um, the, the coral RFP, as stated, assumes that data will be ingressing and egressing at the same time. The only media I know that has good multi-ported access for that is RAM. I don't think we can build a 13 petabyte RAM-based storage system. So um, maybe NVRAM solves this. I, I don't have uh, good insight into that technology. Um, if you are going to have to use some kind of technology where there is persistence behind it, as, as I expect you do, if you've got some kind of log file system sitting there that runs on it like most flash controllers have, is there any head of line locking whenever you try and do that? How do you get a GC or a trim or any of those operations to run and not drop you further and further behind? Uh, in addition to that, you've got to worry about hardening the entire system, again, on this unreliable, or on a network that can be uh, more difficult to make reliable. So uh, I have to thank our sponsors. Um, this was sponsored by Oak Ridge National Lab. And uh, we use resources at the OLCF. And I appreciate all those people and my um, collaborators. Uh, why bother making the burst buffer resilient? I'm sorry? Why bother making the burst buffer resilient? It's a tiny fraction of the machine, so it was going to fail much less frequently. Well, uh, primarily because it's being used for checkpoint storage. So um, if you drop all your checkpoints, your ability for your applications to recover. Now, presume if you can get the data back out of it, it's no problem. But um, if the application, if the if the machine doesn't fail, if the machine partitions rather than fail, um, you, you can't afford to have your, you might not be able to afford to have your burst buffer, your burst buffer uh, bandwidth partition away from it. So for example, if it partitioned where all your burst buffer was in one partition and applications were still running in the other partition, that could be problematic. Um, so partition tolerance, I would think, is one of the key things that you would be worried about.
of making the burst buffer resilient? You need to do more IOPS? I'm sorry? But if you have some kind of a cluster, as low as it is, you still use some resources. The question is if what you consume is justified the resilience. Well, yeah. So, I mean, if, if the system fails in a monolithic manner where the entire system is down, but that's, so at least, and I'm not an expert in this, but <laughs> at least in my experience, and I don't want to talk out of turn, but that's not the way Jaguar or Titan has ever failed. So they have, you know, half their GPUs go down because the, the, the solder was flown wrong on half of them, so they got to turn half those machines off or something like that. Well, the people that were on that application care about what happened there. What you don't want to have is, is all their stuff that was sitting in the burst buffer to fail along with them whenever that happens. You'd like for somehow that to be able, that data, that, they, that last checkpoint that they did get one hour ago to be streamed down. So there is, there is, a, there is a, a desire for that to have some downstream reliability. Now, I can understand that that's a different, a different level of reliability, but... Uh, we might have been talking about cross-purposes. So um, I was assuming that a compute node failure will cause the applications on the compute nodes to fail, but the burst buffer will continue and flush off whatever. So I was just referring to individual burst buffer node failure. At that point, couldn't you just say, well, we, you know, I mean, Slurm detects compute oh. node failure and yeah. will respawn, yeah? Do okay, I agree. Now, that, that, is not the kind of, that is not the kind of issue I'm worried about. The issue I'm worried about is, is being able to extract a coherent issue, being able to extract, extract coherent full checkpoints out of the burst buffer. Um, so if they're on this unreliable network, the Gemini network, where an adjacent node can, in theory, crash you because you're routing traffic through. Um, you'd hope that wouldn't happen. But I guess that's the, that, those are more my concerns um, than, than, an, than an individual compute node failing in that, or an, even an individual burst buffer node failing, I guess, in that sense.